how do we approach the environment? Help us to, we, we want to be better stewards. Help us to understand stewardship and how we approach the natural world. Christians ought to understand our responsibility biblically, totally apart from drowning polar bears, mm. uh, totally apart from arguments about whether or not global warming is a hoax, or totally apart from, apart from political positions. We find in Genesis 1 that when God created man, He created him in order to have dominion. And He blessed humankind and said, rule, subdue. Our responsibility to to manage the natural world is, is a blessing from God, a responsibility given to us. That's where it begins. It doesn't begin with any ecological crisis or with a political position. And uh, what about a, a sort of an eschatological view? I mean, it, it seems to me that we will be one day on a new earth and we will again be in a position of ruling and reigning, but in a very different context without sin, uh, according to Scripture. So uh, it seems to me that this, is, this has been part and parcel of the human activity since the very beginning, to, to engage the natural world, and to rule and to reign, and to be stewards. Disagree. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, could, we can look at the current challenges that we face in environmental issues as really daunting, or we can look at it as an opportunity to practice and to exercise that role which God has prepared us for and which we will do like in eternity. Yeah. And, and so uh, rather than being afraid of engaging environmental issues because the environmentalists are those politically left people that are bad guys that we're in the culture war with, rather than thinking that way and withdrawing, I, I'd like to see the Christian church engage the environmental issues and recognize that as human beings, we are the one species that is uniquely gifted to exercise dominion. That's, that's why we're the only species that has an obligation with respect to the environment. We, we don't hear the environmentalists saying that fish also have a duty to their environment, but humans do. And, and there's a reason for that. And, and this is the reason that we're talking about. So we can begin to practice that and we can re-examine um, the gifts of the spirit that we've studied for how it can equip us to deal with um, matters of the church on earth now and evangelism and missions and so forth and, and good kingdom living in the present time. But we can also re-examine the gifts of the Spirit and, and the natural gifts that the Creator has given us as humans to manage our environment well on His behalf and in partnership with Him. And, and that's where I think there's an opportunity for Christians to be at the table to, and to be involved in environmental issues and where we actually have a contribution to make where others are struggling and their, their basic underlying philosophy can't support the ethic and the moral obligations that they feel inside um, uh, intuitively but, but can't explain why they're there. Well, that almost sounds like you have like a, an apologetic that can be worked from the natural world. I mean, given, given a Christian approach to the natural world, uh, it might actually uh, lend itself to the truth of Christianity. In other words, there, there might not be any other religious or ethical system that can make sense of the natural world in the way a Christian can. I, I like to think about this uh, engaging the world and environmentalists who care as kind of an Act 17 experience, the way Paul spoke to um, the Greeks and said, you know, men of Athens, I see that you are worshiping an unknown God. And then he went on to explain to them who the unknown God is. I, I think we can look at environmentalism in that way and we can say, you know, men of California, I, I see that you care about the environment and you recognize a moral obligation with respect to the environment. Let me share with you what the basis of that is. The basis is that we have a creator and you're your moral intuition about the environment only makes sense in light of a personal creator to whom we owe that duty. Wow. Yeah, I, I imagine philosophers uh, today like Peter Singer and, and Sam Harris, I don't know if you saw the debate, uh, one of our professors in the apologetics program here at Biola, William Lane Craig debated Sam Harris, one of the top, you know, uh, new atheists. And Sam Harris's position was that uh, uh, really, uh, I can have morality apart from God, and here's my morality, uh, to help to uh, enable the flourishing of sentient life. That's it. Any comments on his, uh, his approach to morality? That's it. 
the flourishing of sentient life. Now, it sounds very environmentalistic, uh, but it seems like there might be some pitfalls in that, too. How does he quantify that in terms of flourishing? The numbers of sentient beings or mm. quality of life for those beings? Yeah, it's, it does seem like an argument for cockroaches to dominate. Yeah. In, 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 yeah. <laughs> if they're sentient. <laughs> <laughs> if they're sentient. Well, and even more fundamentally, I would ask him why. Yeah. He, he can't offer a why. He, he has arbitrarily adopted a morality with no basis for it. And if he can't ask, answer the question why, then, then it's not persuasive. Yes, and isn't that, isn't that limiting in terms of sentient life? What about plant life? I mean, uh, we, we ought not to damage plant life and we should, perhaps we should all become free fruitarians. Do you know that position? No, what's that? See, it's, it's, I, am, I am so kind to plant life on earth that I don't actually take the fruit from a tree because that's doing violence to it. Rather, I wait for it to give it on its own accord. <laughs> I am a, no, I'm not a free fruitarian, but uh, you can see how this can be drawn to. So. Well, I guess we should just eat roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> Roadkillitarian doesn't have the same ring. He, um, in some ways, he is adopting in part um, a, a value that he's taking from elsewhere. Right, and so it's free floating, and it's not justified. Exactly what William Lane Craig pointed out. The and in in White's paper, um, he does a similar type of thing, or rather, I shouldn't say he does a similar thing. He comments on this in a different space, where he notes that the modern world has retained a kind of utopian view, fueled by fueled by really a biblical Judeo-Christian idea of there being purpose, telos, that there's this goal that that the world is moving towards something. So that's been retained because we like that, but the goal now is this utopia that we're going to. And I don't think I'm over-reading White there. He doesn't flesh that out like really explicitly like I just did, but I think that's what he's getting at, that in order to sustain some of these things, there has to be a justification. And it's interesting that the justification oftentimes is the Judeo-Christian worldview where we've just co-opted a little bit of it because that part feels all right. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.